Good morning. I'd like to start by thanking the organizers, doctors, um, Zach Kohani and Diane Keo and their colleagues on the I2B2 Transmark Foundation for inviting the Consortium uh, on Pathogen Readiness in Massachusetts to host the panel session today. I'd also like to thank David and Robbie for their eloquent talks and for introducing MassCPR. Um, I am the Executive Director for the Massachusetts Consortium on Pathogen Readiness, abbreviated MassCPR, based at Harvard Medical School. The panelists on the session that I will be moderating have been meeting with MassCPR for many months now to discuss the very same topics that we are bringing to you today. For your thoughts, your input, and for your suggestions. On the topic of better together, the potential and challenges of linking hospital and public health data, I'm happy to introduce Dr. Griffin Weber, Associate Professor at Beth Israel Deaconess Medical Center, Chris Sir, Data Strategy Director at the Mass Department of Public Health, Dr. Shoba Nair, Director of Epidemiology at the Boston Public Health Commission, Dr. Jonathan Lee, Associate Professor at Brigham and Women's Hospital, and Dr. Bill Adams, Professor at the School at the Boston University School of Medicine. I will next hand the microphone to Dr. Griffin Weber. We'll open this session with a presentation on the um, that will offer background on the topic that we will address today. Thank you. Thank you, Nadine, for that introduction and the, and the wonderful uh, keynote from Robert Goldstein and the intro from David Golan. Um, so excited to be part of this Messy PR discussion today. Um, Griffin Weber, I'm a, a faculty member at Harvard Medical School and Beth Israel Deaconess. And um, I'm also on the board of directors of the I2B2 Transmart Foundation. I know a lot of you today here are new to I2B2 or have just heard a little bit about it and it is the I2B2 Transmart Symposium. So I want to give a little bit of a background about what I2B2 is and how that's gonna to connect to what we're hearing today. So I2B2, you see on your tables, is now 20 years old. Back in 2004, we received an NIH infrastructure grant. It was a 10-year grant awarded to Brigham Women's Hospital with Zach Ahani as the PI. And as part of this grant, we created a software program called Informatics for Integrating Biology in the Bedside, or I2B2. The I2B2 software can pull together lots of different kinds of healthcare data, including electronic health record data in the hospitals, clinical trial information, as well as genomics. And there's a simple user-friendly front end that allows investigators to integrate these data and use it for research purposes. We made the software open source, and then after the grant ended, we created the I2B2 Transmart Foundation to continue to support the program and the growing community of users of it. Today, I2B2 is used at over 250 hospitals worldwide as one of their core clinical informatics tools. We also created a complementary system called Shrine, a shared health research information network. This is a federated real-time network that connects different I2B2 instances. Our largest Shrine network is called ANACT. It connects 50 hospitals across the country for um, a total of electronic health record data over more than 100 million lives. A key feature of Shrine and I2B2 networks is that patient level data stay within the institutions. The queries are broadcast out to all different I2B2 sites and they only return aggregate counts and statistics. And this federated model lowers the regulatory barriers to participation and allows many sites to join these networks. There have been many contributors to I2B2 and Shrine over 20 years. I can't possibly list them all in this slide. Um, you'll be hearing from a number of them later today and tomorrow. This is a diagram of the proposed Mass CPR data network. On the left are I2B2 instances that are part of different organizations. We have the hospitals that have electronic health record data and biospecimens, as well as I2B2s that may pull together data sets from the Massachusetts Department of Public Health or the Boston Public Health Commission. These data all stay within the organizations behind their local network firewalls. And then the Shrine software is able to connect these different I2B2s in a real-time federated network for different use cases. For example, real-time infectious disease surveillance across the state, 
clinical trial preparation across diverse populations, pharmacovigilance, where we can identify adverse effects of vaccines and in, in interventions, access to the biospecimens, and overall to improve pathogen readiness. This is what it looks like to the investigators. Um, this is a mock-up of what the Mass CPR data network might look like, but it's based on what the actual I2B2 and Shrine interfaces are, and you'll be seeing that in real time later uh, today. On the left-hand side is a list of medical concepts. There might be hundreds of thousands of different things here. They're integrating lots of different kinds of stuff. So there's electronic health records, demographics, diagnoses, and so on, but you also have biospecimens, registry information, and all the public health data that we can connect into the network. Users drag and drop these medical concepts from the left onto the right query boxes. So for example, here, building a query that's looking for patients who have a biospecimen in one of the different Mass CPR hospitals. Um, they have in a registry, a record of a, a um, SARS-CoV-2 PCR positive test result. And then in the electronic health records, they have no record of having type two diabetes. You can run this query, it gets broadcast out to the different sites, and it'll tell you how many patients in the network meet these different criteria. I wanna mention um, sort of differences between this mass CPR network and then the other national network and NAC that you'll be hearing about right after lunch. So the mass CPR data network is basically a subset of the sites in the national network. We're replicating the NAC infrastructure um, for the mass CPR Massachusetts sites in the ANAC network for mass CPR. By having a subset of sites, we can create our own governance for it, limit the use case down to infectious diseases, and that gives us the ability to link to public health data and specimens. However, we really kind of vision this as a pilot for something that could be replicated, not only around the country, but in other ITB2 instances around the world. And our hope is that this will be successful in Massachusetts, and then we can leverage tools on existing networks like ANAC to expand out to other regions. So with that brief introduction, I'll switch over to Chris here. I'll be talking about the uh, DPH data modernization initiatives and how that will be able to connect into the network. Thank you. Great. Thanks, Griffin. Um, and really happy to be here today. Um, so let's get right into it. So I think uh, it's a little bit hard to follow the uh, commissioner in any uh, circumstance, um, but maybe I'll be a little bit more tactical in terms of some of the things that uh, the DPH is working on relative to data modernization and specifically uh, to the exciting partnership uh, with, with Mass CPR uh, and with our partners at uh, Boston Public Health. So really excited about that. So I think a lot of the background was, was delivered by the commissioner, but more tactically speaking, um, you know, we're really working uh, in an area where uh, we're getting some funding from the CDC. Um, it's, it's not gonna be enough funding. So it's really all about um, how we put the strategy together, how we bring different partners together, both internally and externally. There's no way that um, at DPH, we are gonna modernize on our own. We really need to rely on and bring in partnerships from the outside. So we're, uh, we're excited to be, uh, to be doing that. Um, data modernization at the DPH uh, is really just getting underway as of about a year and a half ago. Um, we've gone through some planning processes. Uh, we very rapidly are moving into some prototyping uh, to really bring our data together at the department into a uh, centralized data store where we can really participate in these federated data networks in a way that's that's effective and that's efficient. Um, if, if you can imagine all of the bureaus and the offices that we uh, have at the DPH, that's a, a rather Herculean task, um, but because of uh, really the, the commissioner's emphasis on this project and because we can rely on uh, partners, external partners to really help us think through how we do this and how we do it the best way, we are, uh, I think in a uh, getting into a pretty good position to to do that work. So as the commissioner uh, pointed out, the strategic plan to advance racial equity sort of underpins uh, all of the work that we're doing uh, from a tactical perspective. That means that internally we need to be talking from agency to ag agency and understanding how do we align our equity data. So that is a conversation that's going on. We're 
uh, talking about the infrastructure we need to put in place so that we're all doing that the same way. Because uh, obviously we can we can connect our data, but unless we're harmonizing that data, uh, we're not going to be able to use it very effectively. This is also building on uh, a deep experience uh, at the Department of Public Health. Um, even though we're modernizing to bring our data into a, a kind of a central repository, we have been in and around data for years and years. Um, and not only that, we have experience uh, with federated data networks. We have the MDPHNet, uh, which has really been uh, kind of piggybacking off some of our infectious disease uh, pipes into some of the hospitals where we have organized uh, a governance structure, which uh, as Griffin will tell you is the, uh, the hardest part of all of this work is to really get that, uh, that governance structure where you can all work together around uh, different data use cases. In this case, is, it's chronic disease. Uh, so we really have some experience uh, over the past 10 years or so that we can rely upon, build upon uh, as we embark on this uh, new and exciting uh, work with Mass CPR and the network that we'll be uh, really working on together. One of the key pieces here, probably the key piece, and I'll sit up here as a Department of Public Health employee and freely admit it, is that we are not, uh, nor will we ever be, nor is, is it our role really to be a leading innovator. Um, we are responsible for the public trust. We are responsible for uh, programming that serves the public. But we have, we, we fortunately in the state of Mass Massachusetts live in a state where we have access to and can partner with some of the leading innovators uh, really in the world. And we're hearing a lot of that already today. Um, so, so the Mass CPR partnership really for us represents getting access to some of the, some of the best brains, uh, not only in the state, but in the, really in the world uh, around how do we do this better, um, around how was this done before? How do we model things in a way where we can really uh, make sure that we're, uh, we're taking the best possible path forward and getting value? Um, the last piece, which is uh, I wanna kind of end on, which is the most important, is that we really are looking to do this in a safe way to maintain the privacy of data. Um, it really is important uh, as we embark on this journey to understand that we are truly, uh, we, we talked a lot about, a, uh, or the commissioner talked a lot about a sort of top down regulations from the uh, federal government, from the state government, and that's great. And, and we would welcome those advances. However, situated where we are, uh, we need to make progress. And so uh, really starting at the grassroots, which use cases make sense to start to prove the value. So that's really our approach uh, in the mass CPR uh, work is to go step by step, prove the value, and then sort of bring people in to, to show them this is worthwhile, let's take the next step. Um, so really that sort of incremental approach is gonna be um, uh, pretty key for us. So. With that, I will uh, hand it to our next speaker and thank you very much for, for having me here today. Good morning. Uh, I, hi, everyone. Thank you, Mass CPR, and uh, thank you for DPH. Uh, you know, for months we have been talking with them, and I am uh, Dr. Shobanair from uh, the Public Health Commission, and I'm the uh, Director of Epidemiology uh, at the Commission. And uh, today what we are talking about is in many ways, an impetus of why we want to be here today and talk about, you know, the different things uh, regarding common data models. And I, I just want to briefly take a, a brief moment here to talk about our own experience of how we went about doing this work of trying to address health equity through starting actually from 2006. So from 2006 onwards, we have been thinking about, you know, work, trying to address health equity through developing a common data model, but at the same time, it was in many ways not a federated data structure. 
it was really at the end of it, it was a centralized model, just like what the co commissioner was talking a bit earlier about, you know, public health being in many ways in the 20th century rather than in the 21st century. That's how, you know, we started out. So in, in 2006, we had this, uh, you know, project called the Health Disparities Project. And through there, there was a regulation that was made in the city of Boston where it was decided that, yeah, you know, all the hospitals here would send data and you know would start collecting data on demographics and other details about patients and the reason why we wanted to do that is because from a health equity perspective the social determinants of health becomes very very important so that's why the idea of you know trying to make sure that you know demographics are collected and done in a consistent fashion so that's how this health disparities project began. And needless to say, we, you know, worked through many, many kind of, um, you know, challenges in terms of, you know, trying to do this work. We had, uh, at, at the same time, I also want to highlight some of the, you know, lessons we learned and also some of the things that we were able to establish through this work that we have. It is, it, uh, you know, what we were calling is the Boston Health Equity Measure Set. That's what we developed. And in that we had, uh, you know, had started with nine hospitals in the Boston area and somewhere around 25 to 30 community health centers. But as we worked through all the different challenges of, you know, uh, data and in terms of consistency of data across all the different hospitals and things like that, we ended up with a smaller group than we originally started out. But in 2020, around the time that, that uh, you know, the pandemic broke out and, you know, we were uh, trying to focus at that time in terms of racism because the city of Boston declared racism as a public health emergency and a crisis at that time during, uh, because of all the things that happened in 2020 besides the pandemic and the inequity that we saw in the pandemic itself. As you know, all of us know that you know the pandemic had different impact across different racial groups, even in terms of mortality. So um, you know, this project became all the more important in trying to help address health equity. So that's where we were, and we had three measures, but those were in uh, uh, chronic diseases, mainly uh, and cancer actually. So it was mainly in terms of depression, uh, breast cancer, and we also looked at childhood vaccination. But when we found, got the data, we found that, you know, the data really was not very helpful in trying to understand what happened to a patient or a person when they went to into one hospital, because all the data was being sent to a centralized location. It was not coming to us. It was going to a central agency that we had a, a private partner that we had, but that data was obviously de-identified and it was sent. So we were not able to link as much as we would have hoped to. So at, at the end of it, after 18 years, we found that what we had really had of very limited value. So the biggest lesson that we really learned was why we need to have something like what we are going to talk about here today over the next two days. I, which is, you know, how to develop and build a large, you know, data models and a common data model to do the kind of work that we really need to have for, you know, health equity purposes. So um, with that, I'll pass it on to the next speaker. Should I do this? Jonathan. Hi. Hi, everyone. Um, I'm Jonathan Lee. I'm uh, a faculty member in the Division of Infectious Disease at the Brigham and Women's Hospital and Harvard Medical School. And I've been uh, called upon just to talk a little bit from the physician and physician scientist perspective on sample and data sharing. I just have uh, one slide uh, to go over, but um, at the beginning of the pandemic, I helped lead some of the sample collection effort through the Mass CPR, trying to, um, at least through the Brigham and, and um, Mass General Brigham, and uh, to try to collect samples from um, part participants with and without uh, COVID so that we can distribute samples to the community. And I wanted to go over some of the, well, at least one example of some of the success that we had, um, but also some of the challenges that we faced um, as well. 
So um, at the beginning of the pandemic, one of the most um, pressing questions that we were dealing with uh, involved pregnant uh, women. In particular, um, how severe were uh, COVID-19 infections in pregnant women, given the fact that um, they were in a relatively kind of Im immune altered or immune suppressed um, state? And in addition, what were the rates and, and the risk of um, transmission of COVID-19 or SARS-CoV-2 from the mother to the fetus as well? And at the time, the you know the um, because of of how little data was out there, there was a lot of fear in the community. And there was a lot of uncertainty in in terms of the clinicians. Um, and um, in addition, uh, there weren't that many patients at any one um, hospital. And so, in order to try to get the data out and to try to um, enroll a large enough sample set, this was a collaboration between three different um, hospitals: the Brigham. Mass General and the BI Deaconess and the OBGYN, the infectious disease uh, physicians. Um, and that resulted in this um, paper that was published in uh, JAMA Network Open, um, in which we enrolled uh, 120 plus um, patients from the three hospitals just over a three month period between April and June of 2020. And um, that included half uh, women who had COVID and half who didn't. And the results um, I thought were were extremely important. This is re represented one of the most um, kind of the earliest and, and gave us some really great insights on the disease processes of pregnant women, showing that one, that there was a spectrum of disease severity, that there were some individuals who were um, who had critical illness, but the majority of pregnant women actually did well. Um, in addition, importantly, we actually saw no evidence of a maternal to fetal transmission of SARS-CoV-2. And when we looked at the placenta, there actually wasn't any evidence of infection of the virus in the placenta. And looking at the receptors, you could see that one of the reasons um, was likely that um, the receptors that you needed for SARS-CoV-2 infection in the placenta was there and relatively rare and, and was not as common as you would see in other tissues. So I think it was one of the, the, the earliest um, and one of the most insightful papers um, looking at um, uh, how uh, COVID-19 and SARS-CoV-2 affected both the mother and the fetus. And um, I wanted to kind of give this as an example, just because I think it really highlights what can be done when these silos are broken down and um, we could come join forces. Um, and, uh, you know, it is kind of, I would say, traditionally been very difficult to do that, but this is what is possible when the, the will is there and the need is there. And through the mass CPR, we have been able to to collect and distribute thousands of samples to the um, um, kind of the Massachusetts and Mass CPR communities, resulted in papers and you know New England Journal and Science and Cell, and and really I think has um, led to a, a ton of brown, groundbreaking research. Um, but uh, sharing samples and data has not been without um, its challenges. Um, one of which is um, has been mentioned already, which is some of the regulatory hurdles and the material transfer agreements that are needed between every single hospital and every other entity. And I think the Mass CPR has really helped um, pave the path by by um, kind of um, uh, having this MTA kind of global MTA such that um, different institutions can can share samples and data with each other without having to worry about it on an individual project level, which would have made it extremely difficult. Um, and then that samples by themselves actually are not that useful. Um, when investigators come to us requesting samples, they don't just say, I want COVID-19 sample, right? They say, I need a COVID-19 sample from an X number of, of pregnant women in their third trimester, or from um, individuals who are immunosuppressed, or from samples that have high levels of SARS-CoV-2 viral load. So you really need the metadata that goes along with the samples. And you really need some of the other associated kind of laboratory um, data as well that can really make these samples uh, useful. So it really has to have a data infrastructure that goes along with the samples um, and having these firewalled EMRs, as we have talked about, has has made that challenging. Um, and then in terms of sample collection and distribution, it is extremely uh, labor intensive um, and costly. And it's not just about collecting the samples, but it's also about the distrib distribution process that when individuals say, well, I need samples from, you know, X number, whoops, X number of, of um, individuals with 
diabetes um, who are also pregnant. Well, then you have to go back and try to to locate those samples, you know, um, pull those samples from the freezer and then distribute them. And it actually can be a quite a challenging process. And I would say that um, historically, the NIH and other funders have not done a great job of funding sample collection um, efforts or distribution efforts. And um, it uh, uh, there's just not a lot of money um, in that um, area. And in addition, if you um, most of the individuals who are doing the sample distribution, I mean, we're we're academicians, right? And the coin of the of the academic land is publications, especially first author, last author publications. And when you're kind of in there spending a lot of time doing um, sample collection and distribution, you're not getting a lot of those first and last author publications. And so, how do you make this a benefit to all parties um, involved? And then finally, you know, um, being able to link the investigator with the right um, the data set, you know, not all hospitals have the same um, patients and same patient mix. Um, and so being able to link people to the right data sets, I think, has also been a challenge. So just wanted to highlight from a physician, physician scientist perspective, um, both what is possible and what, you know, COVID has in many ways kind of allowed us to envision as a, as a um, what, you know, what we can all do kind of together um, without kind of worrying about some of the the, the barriers of the different um, hospitals and, and academic centers. But also, again, it, it even COVID um, really, I think, laid bare a lot of the challenges um, and that kind of impeded efforts even during COVID and now afterwards as well. So um, also, um, I'm not sure the next speaker is, or, is it Bill or, okay, go ahead. <laughs> Well, thank you all for these quick introductions of your background and what you've been uh, asking about. Um, so I will also invite Griffin to join us and we're going to continue discussion around the table. Griffin, please, you can sit over here if you'd like to and I can stand. Thank you. All right. Um, so this group, like I said before, has been meeting for some time together. Um, not everyone could be here today, but I think we have a representative population of who's been thinking about the Federated Data Network, the questions that we are asking, the answers we are able to find, the answers we are still looking for, and what we are uh, thinking as next steps for implementing uh, that dream that the commissioner spoke about earlier on. Um, I would like to continue dreaming um, and I would like to ask John uh, to tell us what the clinician's metadata uh, database would look like. What would be the information that would be most beneficial in your line of work? And what would it look like so that you were able to console the database uh, for your investigations? So when it came when it came to um, COVID nineteen, it was actually um, a surprise as to us as to the range of data that that the clinicians really wanted because you had people coming in who were cardiologists who wanted to study the heart and the effect of the infections on the heart. You had OBGYNs who wanted to come in and study um, pregnancy. You had um, oncologists right who wanted to study the effect of these infections on the um, immunosuppressed uh, population. Um, and then you had individuals who are working on novel assays, right? Point of care assays who say, well, you know, I need, I've got this great assay and I need to validate it with samples with, with both high intermediate and low viral copy numbers, RNA copy numbers from your nasal swabs. Or if you've got blood samples, we can look at that too, to look for signatures of infection or, or long COVID, right? For example. And so um, I, I, it's hard to, uh, I think, really easily say, well, this is the, you know, we just need this little, you know, piece of data and that'll be enough. Because so sometimes the the different stakeholders and the people who want the samples really want different um, areas. Now, I, I think that um, the database doesn't have to be, you know, absolutely comprehensive to have everything, every single data. I think that is probably not realistic, but to just say, okay, well, hey, you're looking for pregnant women. Well, here, look, this hospital, this system has X number of pregnant women with COVID um, with, you know, probably, you know, kind of the, this amount of samples that are available from this sample collection. Well, here are the people you need to talk to from that hospital who, who can kind of get you all the additional data, because then what you want is a 
partner in that case, someone, an OBGYN in that hospital who knows a lot about their patients who can then provide all the other data you might need. And then at least, at the least, I, I think it can be really useful to, to, to actually show you who has that, that, that sample cohort available, who can, who then you can reach out to and actually develop a working relationship with that person and then kind of benefit all sides. Thank you. That makes, that makes sense to me. Um, so in a way, you've been doing that manually recently. So from what I've noticed, there's a, you've been running your own database, doing a lot of queries manually, um, distributing a lot of samples. And in a way, um, it works because you are communicating with people that know you, people that know what you're doing, people that know that they, what they are asking for. And then in broader discussions, when we get external requests, uh, when we discuss among ourselves what other partners in MassCPR have received as requests, we realize that we are not that well connected. We realize that we don't know about the other people's collections and that there would be benefit in uh, connecting th that information at least to know what is available at what time. And so that's probably something that you would envision as being part of your dream metadata base. Yeah, I mean, during the um, pandemic, I think there was within the hospitals, there were infrastructure set up, they had COVID sample kind of distribution, um, kind of steering committees that people knew, you know, where to go to, to try to find these samples. But, you know, as you said, every hospital had kind of their own distribution network and committee set up. And it was hard sometimes to figure out where to go um, for samples. And so I think at and at this point, I think you've got new investigators coming in even now into the field as well. So, you know, having a centralized um, a kind of uh, contact person and a centralized database or a centralized, you know, kind of clearinghouse to be able to say, okay, well, we're linking all of these different hospitals and different investigators together. I think there's a lot of value to that because as you, as you said, tons of people out there probably don't even know that we have samples available, at, you know, within our within the Brigham or, or how to get access to it. I think that's correct. Um, Griffin, what would that imply for our use cases list? We've been thinking about who the users are going to be, how they're going to use it, what's the subject of the use. And so based on what John just told us, what does that inspire you uh, for our use case list? Yes, thank you. So one of the themes that Jonathan was mentioning about, and it comes up in our governance discussion, is what kind of data are part of this network. So we talk about infectious disease use cases, and it's different from infectious disease data. So we're not limiting to infectious disease data because that's very hard to define. We don't know what kind of information is needed. So when we're talking about the data network, we're looking at actually all the information that's within the hospitals, all the different diagnoses, laboratory tests, medications that patients have because they all might be relevant to the types of research questions people are asking. So you can go to these tools and you may be asking a infectious disease question, but then integrating different kinds of data. It's important that, the net, that this network is not a central database. We're not pulling together information from all the hospitals into one location. It's more about pointers. You can describe what you're looking for, what kind of specimens, what kind of data, then that same query gets sent out to all the different uh, organizations that are part of the network. Each one can figure what they have out locally, and that information then gets combined centrally so you know where to go to find the specimens, but the tool itself isn't mailing you the specimen or delivering the data sets to you. It's showing you what exists, what correlations are there, but it's not taking the information or the data out of the organizations. Thank you. Those are important details, and that occupies a lot of our biweekly meetings where we discuss those use cases and how we would go about it. Um, now, I would like to go to um, back to um, something that someone in the audience um, alluded to earlier, that this is not by any means a new effort, that this is something that a lot of places uh, in the country have been thinking about. And I think in that respect, uh, Shoba has um, quite a lot of background to give us to, towards the history of trying to connect the community health centers. And um, I believe 17 years of sitting around the table and um, trying to agree on what is shared with whom and when. Um, so if you could give um, our audience a little bit of background, I think that would also allow us to frame our own initiative at this time. 
Yeah, I think. Yeah, so when we started out, like I said, I wasn't there, but, uh, you know, when we started out, when this project started out, um, you, what had happened was like we had nine uh, hospitals and around 30, um, you know, community health centers that were part of this uh, project. Um, but again, you know, again, we ran into the same issues of data, uh, you know, governance that, uh, you know, uh, Griffin, you're talking about, you know, how how do you share the data? How do you define each of the, you know, uh, variables that you might want in this? It, again, you know, pe although we were talking about sharing and, you know, uh, all the hospitals and each of the community health centers sharing the data, the idea was that that shared data, again, would be in a centralized model with the private partner. So that is how that model was. And I think that is where much of the challenge was, which is that if it is going to be sent into a centralized system, even though it may not be with BPHC, but it is with a private entity, even and even though it is covered by HIPAA, that, I, that ownership of data, when it is transferred from hospitals to a private entity, even if it is de-identified, what does that mean? I think that was the biggest challenge that you know we came across. And of course, another challenge that we came across was in terms of capacity for each of the organizations, the hospitals and the community health centers in terms of capacity. Capacity to do this work in addition to all the work that they are already doing. So whether they would have that capacity and you know how would that data sharing look like? So these were some of the challenges that we had. So therefore, in the end, as, as, as we continued these conversations, both in terms of defining what our measures will be and what our um, you know, definitions and what kind of variables will go into this new centralized uh, uh, data base that a private entity will hold, more and more organizations, hospitals, as well as community health centers realized that they really didn't have the capacity to be able to do this work. They came in to the table, I think, yeah, and we had a lot of uh, you know, conversations in terms of you know, defining variables, but when it came time to really supplying the data, I think that you know there was a little thinking that went into it with you know in terms of okay you know what are we passing on um, data to so in the end we ended up with a summary of data that each uh, organizations would be able to share so each organizations that is what happened that you know every hospital and organization that were there they ended up sending summary data to our um, to our uh, private entity, private partner. So therefore, it wasn't, as you can see, not of much use after that because it was summary data and it was summarized at that level. So, you know, we were not able to really look at, you know, some of the things that we really had wanted to look at, which is, you know, uh, understand health equity uh, and try to understand, um, you know, how it impacts people whether anything is different in terms of people across, you know, different racial groups or other social determinants of health. So, yeah, you know, so that is the story that we have. So the fact that, you know, today we are thinking of a common data model with a governance structure and which will be federated, which means that, you know, people, uh, you know, entities are going to own their data that is not going to change but there will be, uh, you know, maybe some kind of shared understanding of, you know, how that governance structure will look like. I think that I would go a very long way, um, you know, in trying to remedy some of the challenges that we had. And I also want to add, you know, since 2006 that we started, we have an alumni network almost, right? I mean, because they were the initial people who were at the table talking about just this that we are talking about today, which is how to share data across different entities. So in a way, you know, we have an alumni network because there, there are all these hospitals and community health centers who are already thinking way back in 2006 about this 
So, you know, so that is another, you know, chal a challenge, but really a lesson that everybody learned in terms of, okay, you know, we really need a federated uh, data network. So. Thank you, Shoba. Um, I think that very often when we are talking about the content of that data network, when you summarize the history of your experience with trying to build one, what comes to my mind as a former bench scientist who generated data and passed that on to collaborators is uh, what are the data formats when we talk about privacy questions, when we talk about limitations, um, can we find a common ground of delivering the data in a specific format that will allow uh, informing the partner, the collaborator, without breaching those um, privacy concerns that we have? And I think um, I will turn it to Bill, Bill Adams, who has a lot of experience in that field. You recently told me that you considered yourself some sort of technician who was designing and conceptualizing networks to make data linkage possible. And then you said that the governance and regulatory elements are the true bottlenecks to those efforts. So in a perfect world, that would make your life easier. How could you, how could you go about that? Yeah, so um, thanks for inviting me to talk. A little bit of background on where I'm coming from. So I'm a primary care pediatrician, so I see healthcare from the primary care perspective often. Um, but I lead our translational informatics core over at Boston Medical Center and Boston University. You probably all know that Boston Medical Center is the largest safety net hospital in New England, so we have a very special population that we take care of. And we're tightly affiliated with 14 federally qualified health centers in the city of Boston, too. So together, between Boston Medical Center and the community health centers, we take care of a very large proportion of the city of Boston, most of whom haven't been represented in large data sets um, traditionally. I think it's changing, but a major thrust of our work, especially in the translational informatics world, is making sure that the patients that we take care of are represented in data systems that support research and research infrastructure. To that end, um, we are a relatively small shop of informatics folks, so we are constrained by some really important pragmatic considerations. Uh, I think my staff is officially two or three people, depending on the day, um, and myself. Uh, I'm pretty hands-on and deeply involved myself, and so what we need are pragmatic solutions that are reusable. And so this is why we love common data models, because other folks can do the really hard work of building the infrastructure we were one of the early adopters of I2B2, and we still love it and use it. We participate in the ENAC network. Recently, we've also added OMOP as a complementary data model, too, so we can work with both systems. But it really gives us this common language to work and collaborate in a way that we couldn't possibly do if we were building things ourselves. Um, we also um, have a lot of concerns where we are about protecting patient privacy, especially in the special population that we take care of that has traditionally been quite suspicious of um, how people use and study um, health, use data and study health. Um, and so we have to be really, really careful about that. And that's why we like distributed models because all the data stays where it is. Our executive leaders understand that and that we sort of on a, on a case by case basis are able to share the rich data that we have in a very focused way. And literally by being part of the ENAC network, um, we're not fully up and running with mass CPR, but we, we think it would be relatively easy um, to uh, get that going soon. Um, and so that infrastructure sets us up really well um, to partner as part of the network. And lastly, I'll just say, we're also working on some new stuff uh, of our own using our shiny apps and um, some innovative technology that uses the same common data models to create um, a supplementary way to explore health equity in the city of Boston. And that's another way that these tools and infrastructure can make it relatively easy. I wouldn't say it's easy, easy, but um, it's relatively easy to be creative and innovative um, using these tools. And so we're really happy to be part of the network um, to extend the use and to even think about in the future, other ways we could use this inf infrastructure to um, improve the health of Boston. Thank you. Thank you, Bill. It's all good to know. And we know that we are, in a way, almost copying in act, but giving it a reformatting and uh, 
using it for very specific purposes. So I would like to allow um, some time for questions from the audience. We came here today to discuss with you, uh, to hear your thoughts. I will perhaps just ask one last question to Chris uh, at the DPH. Um, and and that could pro possibly lead the le the way to the Q and A. And that would be, um, what would be the first data that you would share and and that you would want access to from the DPH perspective, uh, if that is possible. What's what's your first priority? I think based on the the work that we're looking at now, uh, clearly the infectious disease data um, and potentially some samples data is going to be really important. I, I would like to break a little bit into the future, though, as we talk about health equity and we talk about data that's relevant to that and and really looking at different angles at looking at health equity and looking that across both infectious disease, chronic disease, kind of the spectrum. We have some, I think, data that would connect really well to, for instance, community health center data um, in our um, Department of Children and Families, in our Department of Trans Transitional Assistance, uh, Department of uh, you know, Development. Uh, so we have a, a lot of data that we could, we could connect in safely, um, anonymized, that would give a lot of um, additional insights, I think, uh, into, uh, into vulnerable populations. And that's really, I think, Maybe the one of the key themes that's that sort of cut across all of our talks today is how do we how do we focus our efforts on on folks that are more vulnerable? And so I think we have a lot of opportunities, both with with traditional data that we would we would work with, so infectious disease, but as we look at the broader landscape uh, at the department uh, and across the secretariat, um, there's a lot of data there that again, safely, according to to law to regulation, um, that I think could really help us to, to think about different interventions, follow through on those interventions, and frankly, have a different uh, conversation, a different kind of collaboration with our private partners, uh, which I think is really exciting. Uh, if, you're, if you're an epidemiologist in, uh, in DPH, then you're really excited about this prospect of being able to work with uh, kind of a broader set of uh, really smart individuals. So uh, expanded your, your a little bit around your question, but I hope that that that's uh, that's helpful. Bill, do you do you mind if I ask you a quick question? So you know, for um, the samples that are collected through these academic hospitals, obviously they've gone through informed consent, and you know, for 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 sharing and further use of the samples, it was. Can you discuss kind of the um, the regulatory and privacy issues surrounding samples and and data collected by the DPH and how that informs what you can and cannot share with with everyone else? Just gonna phone in my my lawyers, my legal team here, and have them know. Um, so it, it is uh, it is a complicated landscape. Um, what we do is we we have an IRB right that works with with researchers. So there's there's a an in place process to do that. The public health data warehouse uh, is a is a a tool that we offer to researchers as well, which is actually a, a fairly broad set of data. It includes uh, uh, Department of Transitional Assistance, things like criminal justice. Um, so it really gives you kind of that broad landscape. And again, there are uh, sort of a set of uh, regulations and processes in place. We wanna make that more accessible today to use the, the public health data warehouse. You have to physically walk into a building. You have to get in on one of our terminals that doesn't feel like the most accessible uh, route to offering our data. So I think we have a lot of opportunities to take existing data that we have, existing processes, to your point around laws and regulations and how we've interpreted and applied those and rethink that. Because now we have things like data clean rooms. We have things like uh, to do a lot of preparatory work, which I'm sure a lot of folks will be getting into later, is um, things like synthetic data, et cetera, where we can do a lot of the work together, a lot of the thinking work while that sort of legal and regulatory work might have to follow a little bit on the side, whether that's an, an IRB or whether that's some of the governance that we're putting in place uh, for our federated data network, which, which will always take some time to make sure that we're doing things uh, absolutely uh, by the book, but also uh, making sure that for the commissioner's really uh, strategy that we're pushing ourselves to, to offer more data and have more data collaboration. Agreed. And I think governance plans and policy questions are going to occupy us a lot moving forward. 
Um, so I would like to thank my five panelists for having answered my questions. And now I would like to turn it to the audience so that you also get an opportunity to ask yours. Uh, thank you for a very interesting panel. The question I have for you, I think I want to start with Bill, is I heard you loud and clear saying that being able, having a standard data model and being able to repurpose the data for more than one question was important. I think it's, a, it's an important intuition. Are there issues around, first of all, if there were a agreement in this collective that there were in fact, other studies that you might want to undertake. Let's say about rare diseases, for example. Would the current consent regime have created a problem for you to do those studies? In other words, I could imagine wrongly that mass CPR has a certain their consent or just data that's used as part of clinical care. And if you want to use it for other things, would you need a different consent mechanism? And if so, how do you, how do you go and solve that problem? So that is a great question. And I don't have the answer to your question. I can tell you, yes, it would definitely create problems for us. And numerous other projects where we have an initial consent form that um, is trying to be repurposed involves quite a bit of work in recontacting subjects. Um, so if folks can innovate in that space or find better ways, most of our successes have been in finding ways to share highly de-identified, maybe not anonymized data, but getting as de-identified as possible and then creating a very, very secure infrastructure to share information um, because the recontacting would definitely be a challenge for us. I mean, this is a central challenge. I was talking to folks at Apple, which have enormous consumer-based studies and their researchers are complaining that they have three different studies and they cannot share data between these each of the studies for exactly that reason. And so I, I think that if we could figure out what kind of consent regime we could have for patients in Boston to sign up when they're patients or that they could opt out of, that's a whole, I'm not asking you to do it, but it would be an interesting uh, societal contribution to have that kind of consent. I agree. And with us, you know, it's, it wasn't always this way, but the technical challenges are, are small compared to the consent and the governance questions, which are really labor intensive and tricky and involve a lot of diplomacy. And, but again, I just want to point out that our city actually has an opportunity to actually demonstrate exactly that kind of leadership I can tell you that it's not going to come from Apple. That's scary to them. It's not going to come at the federal level. It's scary to them. So there's an opportunity. Just one quick story. Um, people may not know this, but Massachusetts was the first state in the country to pass a, a law that says you have to report every immunization that you administer to the Department of Public Health. Very For other states, it's an opt-in, opt-out process. Massachusetts, we said immunizations are really important. Everyone has to report it. You can just limit sharing. You as a patient can say, I don't want anyone other than the Department of Public Health to know about this, but everyone has to report it. And it, fo it formed the foundation for the immunization registry, which was incredibly helpful during COVID and um, is up and running, and which I spent a lot of years working on. So it, it's something to be proud of in Massachusetts. Definitely something to be proud of. Uh, I have a question, maybe for Chris, but maybe for Griffin too. So. Following up on data is being used for many different purposes. And in particular, in public health, there might be a different criteria or set of constraints around what you want the data to say versus what you want the science to say when you collect data. So I'll give you an example. So uh, one of the projects that were done during COVID by this, by this group was um, looking at hospitalizations uh, that were from COVID. But it turned out that uh, there's a lot of hospitalizations and people were positive for COVID, but they weren't being hospitalized for COVID, they were being hospitalized for 
a bike accident or something of that nature. Um, but they were being reported as a COVID case. Um, now, for public reporting, okay, that kind of gets out in the wash. But for science, it would be important to know, for example, if somebody was actually hospitalized for COVID and had a serious case of COVID or if it was for something else. Okay. So for this network that we're thinking about, would we be using perhaps this concept of computed phenotypes in that something that takes the public health data uh, that we typically collect, like, you know, ICD-10 codes and so forth, and make them into something that's more usable for science, where we actually know what the diagnosis is. Another uh, project that this group did was um, when they did computed phenotypes for diabetes, for example, it turns out that if you have an ICD-10 code for diabetes, you have a 50% chance, it turns out, of actually having diabetes. Um, so yeah. that's... Um, so how how is the network going to respond to that? And um, all right, thank you, Sean, for giving a segue to the rest of the conference. Uh, but these are important points that we are actually going to hear a lot about um, later today and tomorrow about how to the difference between the raw EHR data that we have and the actual diseases or conditions that patients have and how to leverage kind of a cleaned up version of this. So um, we are leveraging since we're leveraging the I2B2 and shrine infrastructures of that, all the work that we have been doing in I2B2 to, to sort of clean up the data and create digital twins of the actual patients will be able to bubble up into this network. And you can query on the raw codes and you find all the patients who have a code for diabetes, but then you'd also be able to leverage the phenotypes to get the um, sort of the, the science version of that answer. There are other aspects of this that are going to be important in the network here. One of them is the overlap in populations between the different institutions. So um, you know, there may be a code for diabetes at one hospital, but patients getting medications at another hospital and the public health has the, um, the vaccine information. So we haven't really worried about that so much in national networks when there's a lot of geographic separation between the institutions. But here where the, our, all of our sites are so close, we're going to have to look about digital twins across the different institutions, how to match records up in secure ways, how to handle rare and um, unusual events that might uh, be below our typical obfuscation thresholds. So this is going to be an important um, topic as we build up the network and we're gonna to have to explore other aspects of this digital twin concept that we haven't really worried about in single EHR data sets. Yeah, <clears throat> my wife is a nocturnist, so she's done a, had her share of, you know, is this test, you know, is this patient a COVID patient? Is this, is this, um, something that's come in on another vector. And there's there was a lot of confusion around that. So I think those things are really important. Um, I think one of the things that we've uh, had in place for a fairly long time and is actually uh, a part of our MDPH net network is uh, a set of algorithms that is that is sort of trying to look at the broader data to understand where the cases really are and both for um, finding cases that weren't identified through codes um, or identifying where there may have been a false positive. So we do have some, some assets in place that I think could be helpful in this sort of broader conversation and something that we can um, maybe, uh, you know, include not just the data in our conversation, but how are we looking at the data? How are we approaching it from a, um, trying to dissect it and, and make sure that we're, we're being accurate with, with uh, what, we're, what we're seeing? Chris, can I actually ask you something that I've been wondering for a long time? So every day I get the Boston Globe's report on how many COVID cases there are and how many deaths there are from COVID. And it's always like five or six. Are those actual deaths from COVID or are they just people who died and happened to have a positive COVID test at the same time? You've, uh, you've gone beyond my... Uh... <laughs> yeah. Something. Yeah, yeah, you've definitely gone gone beyond me uh, as well. But I can point you in the right direction to ask that question and and uh, get an accurate answer. So I will see you afterwards. I just want to add to that one uh, thing that you know Chris was talking about. So 
typically i think when when the you know department the dph also has what is called the case mix data uh, in that, when you look at that kind of a data set, what you have is data that comes from hospitals, ED, and observational visits. And typically, those, those kinds of data sets actually has many different diagnoses. There are uh, possibilities for up to 30 diagnoses on that data set. So to answer your question, uh, Sean, what you're talking about, maybe something like accessing that data set might be a good way to be able to answer some of the questions that you are talking about, whether it was a primary diagnosis or a secondary, and if it is secondary, how far secondary was it too? Because there are 30 possibilities of diagnosis codes that come into that, so. Thank you. I think we are at time, or is there still room for another question? Fantastic. Two more questions, great. <laughs> Hi, thanks for the great panel. Um, I'm Prashant from Intel. Uh, I'm wondering, you're creating this pretty robust federated data network. Um, most of the use cases that I'm seeing are basically querying and being able to get some statistics out of it or aggregate counts out of it. Are there any plans to actually leverage this powerful network that you're building for AI and ML use cases where you can train clinical models across this federated network or even validate a model that has been created on this federated data that potentially exposes the model to diverse data sets so that the models are not biased? Well, um, in the last couple years at the symposium, we spoke a lot about a consortium called 4C. It leveraged the data that's within our I2B2 and Shrine systems, but somewhat of a different approach of using it. And that network, instead of using our front-end query tool to say just how many patients had something, we're able to actually distribute out SQL and R scripts to different sites. They ran on a Docker environment locally within each institution and pointed to their I2B2 systems. And there we were able to do much more advanced machine learning type algorithms. What Sean was talking about with our study on um, trying to find out patients who were admitted for COVID or versus or with COVID, it worked like that. We're able to distribute out the algorithms. But as this I2B2 Shrine platform evolves, we may be able to automate that more. I think we'll be hearing some talks about that, but that's right. There's, you can do aggregate to space account, but aggregate as the result of a very complex machine learning model is also a, a thing that you can do while retaining patient privacy and keeping the data within the institutions. So uh, just a quick question before the break. So Uri Sachs, um, Göttingen, uh, Germany. Maybe the European perspective is interesting because we failed to contribute to the 4C uh, consortium because of GDPR. So a lot of thinking was there afterwards. And now we have a Health Data Act uh, turning the whole consent uh, story around because now it's an opt-out. So if you don't want to have your data being shared, um, you have to opt out. Um, and I think that actually shows the result that the informed consent story doesn't really scale anymore. It's, it's way too complicated. So uh, that's one thing. Second thing, record linkage will be still a problem. So my question would have been, how would you link data from public health, um, which might occur half year after the fact, uh, to together with clinical data, if you don't have a some kind of um, identific and a national identificator, something we're just uh, chewing on because all the methods we have up to now, they, they're not good. So they are error prone and uh, untimely. So uh, that might be another problem. So maybe you've got the, the magic solution we could use for our project. Thank you. Um, there's a kind of formal term for what you're calling, it's called privacy preserving record linkage. And we're not going to be talking about it that much at this symposium, but I imagine it's going to come up in the next year or two as this network grows. Now, one way of doing it is actually if you have a unique identifier for all of your patients, you can match at the patient level. But you can do it more aggregate level if you're willing to um, reduce some of the accuracy there. So, for example, when we're linking public health data and the hospital data, we may be doing it 
at a zip code level. So we're, we collect wastewater information and we have wastewater levels that may be reported by neighborhood or geographic region by time period. And then you can look at those same geographic time breakdowns within the electronic health records. You're getting correlations between aggregate information, even though you're not linking at individual patients or putting into the public health data, synthetic data sets where you have 600,000 to virtual Boston residents that you're, um, you don't, can't match an individual one to a person within the hospital, but the distributions across the different data sets can be lined up. You can do it that way. Um, a lot of it, again, has to do with the governance. We have the technical capacity to link at many different levels. It's what people feel comfortable with and what use cases, the kind of granularity of that linkage has to be. And I'll just quickly add at the department, at the secretariat level, we are looking at master data management across the secretariat. So it's it's just in our pod, just in our data, but it gives us a platform to, to better have that conversation uh, around how we link uh, externally. All right, I think that was the last question for now. Uh, we will probably be staying around so you can still uh, follow us to the coffee uh, uh, break and, and continue to engaging with us. Um, for myself, I am uh, grateful to the panelists for taking the time to join us today uh, and for answering uh, my questions and your questions. And we look forward to giving you more updates on this initiative in the future. Thank you. <laughs>